everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Tips and Tricks for Successful Multiplexing IHC. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, please visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You can also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Darpan Saraswat. Darpan is a neuroscientist and microscopist with a doctorate degree in biology at HNB Garwal University and a Master of Science in Biotechnology from DDU Gorakhpur University. For a complete biography on today's speaker, click their name in the presenter's window at the top right of your screen. Darpan, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, thank you for thank you very much for attending today's webinar on Multiplex ISC. My name is Darpan Saraswat. I have been working with Thermo Fisher since Scientific since 2021 as a technical ap application scientist, supporting EVOS microscopes and Thermo Fisher cell analysis product portfolio. If you want to detect multiple targets in your IC experiment, but no, don't know how to design this experiment, or you are doing it, but you are having, having some doubts, this presentation is for you. What is multiplex immunohistochemistry? It's a, it's a technique that allows multiple biomarkers to be simultaneously detected in a single tissue section, which help us to illustrate the spatial relationship among individual cell types. It could be threeplex, fourplex, or more. So either you are doing immunohistochemistry experiment, like a single plex or a multiplex experiment, the first three steps like sample preparation, antigen retrieval, and the blocking backgrounds are same. The main difference comes at the fourth step, which is target detections. Here, you should be very careful on choosing the primary antibody, secondary antibody, diet choice, and potential amplification methods. Finally, sample is mounted with an appropriate mounting media and analyze samples on a microscope with the appropriate imaging softwares. This is an example image of three-plex immunohistochemistry assay on adult mouse retina tissue using new N and beta-3 tubulin antibodies. The samples were counter-stained using DAPI. In vitro gen prolonged glass antifade reagent is used as a mountain, and the images are captured using EVOS M5000 microscope. This is an example four-plex image of human tonsil tissue labeled with KI67, pen cytokeratin, smooth muscle actin, and counter stain with horse dye. Prolonged glass antifed reagent is used as a mountain, and images were captured using M7000 automatic microscope. So before deciding, uh, before starting your multiplex immunohistochemistry chem chemistry experiment, it's very important to know the imaging pl platform and the quantification techniques that you are going to use. So if you are doing a fourplex assay, you can use in vitro gen EVOS M7000 or EVOS M5000, and you can use fluorophores, red, blue, green, and far red fluorophores or near infrared fluorophores for in our EVOS M5000 and EVOS M7000 scopes. Now let's talk about sample preparation, which is very crucial step for successful immunohistochemistry. It is very important to prefix animal tissue by using paraformaldehyde and avoid glutaldehyde if you are using uh, fluorescence imaging as it will increase autofluorescence. Next, you have to do the tissue embedding for either paraffin processing or cryogen processing, but make sure to avoid folds in your tissues, bubbles in your tissues, or make sure and make sure the tissue is properly adhered on the slides. 
if that it does not happen what happen in the immuno, when you are performing immunohistochemistry you will notice tissue tearing or disruption and you will lose the important spatial information from that tissue the third step is post fixation if you think the pre fixation is not enough or you have used in the fresh frozen tissue you can post fix your tissue using gluten uh, using formaldehyde or coagulating reagents like methanol or acetones the, the fourth, fourth and more very important step is permeabilization. It's required if the antibody need, needs to access to, to go inside of the cells to detect target antigen. For example, intracellular proteins and cytoplasmic epitopes of transmembrane protein. You can use permeabilization uh, detergents like uh, Triton IX, saponin, or TN20, or you can use solvents like acetones for permeabilizations. If, anti, if permeabilization is not enough, you can perform antigen retrieval to expose antigen binding sites for antibody labeling using uh, by, by heating samples in a citrate buffer or using proteolytic enzymes like pepsin, pronase, proteinase K, or com combinations of both. If you have done uh, immunohistochemistry before, you have, must have noticed that some samples have high, high autofluorescence. Autofluorescence may be because of aldehyde fixation. Autofluorescence also comes from paraffin processing, and sometimes it comes from natural sources like aldehyde, vitamins, lipofusin, plant protein, and pigments. So what you will do to reduce this autofluorescence you can use chemical treatments like sodium borohydrate treatment. Quench, uh, you can use quenching methods like you using cupric sulfate, Evans blue, Sudan black. You can quench the autofluorescence. Or you can use in vitro gen thyramidine super boost amplification kits to amplify over autofluorescence. Or you can use digital removal, uh, digitally remove the autofluorescence using in vitro gen Celeste software. Or you have a, or in your lab, if you have a spectral deconvolution system, that can also be used to digitally remove autofluorescence from your sample. To reduce uh, background signals and false po positive, it's very important to use protein-based components or serums to bind to structures that would otherwise attract antibody. Uh, there are different type of blockers av available like normal serum. You can use protein solution like BSA, gelatin, non-fat dry milk, or you can use pre-formulated blocking, commercial blocking buffers. Sometimes additional blocking steps are reading, uh, required if you are using amplification steps. In that cases, you need endogenous biotin, endogenous peroxidase, and endogenous phosphatase blocking steps. Please make sure when you are doing a blo block, uh, when you are using uh, blocking your samples, to check the negative control and the positive controls with various blocking reagent and choose the uh, choose the right blocking bu buffer that yields highest signal to noise ratio. Make sure your blocking reagent does not have any any component which will interfere with your your assay. Suppose you are using uh, biotin binding protein and and you and you want to use dry milk for that dry milk contains biotin so in that case uh, uh, dry milk is not the right blocking buffer for your experiment for optimal assay i i would highly recommend that use the same blocking buffer for diluting your primary antibodies with this background let's discuss how to plan multiplex ISC experiments. First, you need to choose the right primary antibody. And second, you have to choose the right fluorophore and image settings. I will talk about these bullet, bullet points in my later slides, and, this in, and I, I'm going to discuss these bullet points in, in details. So let's start. The primary antibody is the most important aspect of immunohistochemistry. If you are doing an ISC experiment, make sure to choose the antibody which is tested for immunohistochemistry experiment. Make sure the antibody is species specificity of the primary antibody. Decide 
do you need a polyclonal antibody? Polyclonal antibody will bind to multi multi multiple sites on your gene of, on, on your target, while monoclonal antibody will bind only to single epitope sites. So based on your experimental needs, how much specificity you want, you have to decide between the polyclonal and the monoclonal antibody. Make sure to consider the clone of the antibody because some clone of the antibody will work better on some specific tissues. So based on your tissue, you have to choose the right clone of the antibody and avoid same species staining. Here, the subtype of primary import antibody is very important. So if you are using, uh, using uh, IgG1 antibodies, you have to be make sure the secondary antibody which you are going to use is IgG1 uh, for a multiplexing experiment. Make sure the antibody is within the stability period and stored properly. You can go to our Thermo Fisher Scientific Antibody Research Tool and you can check these things. Like you can check the, the application of a primary antibody. Is it validated for IHC, at IHC application or not? You can go to Advanced Verification tab to see the antibody specificity data. You can go in the Conjugate tab to see if the antibody is already conjugated to the fluorophore or if you need the unconjugated primary antibody. Uh, it's very important to optimize your primary antibody protocol. Commercial antibodies comes with the protocol, but the opti optimal condition must be determined empirically with every sample. Make sure to tighter the antibody concentration. You can use the starting point, which is recommended by the, by, which is recommended, but make sure to tighter different concentration of the antibody to get the appropriate concentration, optimize the incubation time, try different blocking solutions to reduce non-specific binding. And if you are using intracellular proteins, try make sure to use antigen retrieval. If you don't follow these steps, what will go wrong? If suppose you, you use too much antibody, you will see the oversaturation of the signals. With the correct antibody titer, you, you will see appropriate, lab, appropriate lab, labeling in, as, uh, appropriate labeling without uh, non-specific binding. For a multiplex uh, analysis, it's very important to uh, use the right titer of your antibody. A lot of the same precaution uh, is required for choosing the secondary antibody as um, make sure the specificity of the primary antibody species, avoid same species staining. Subtype of antibody is very important. So it should match with the primary antibody. Make sure the antibody is within the stability period and is stored properly. And Choose the appropriate conjugate like dye, biotin, or enzyme based on the relative target abundance. As with primary antibody, secondary antibody should always be optimized. One protocol does not fit all. Tighter antibody concentration, optimize incubation time. Make sure to use the same blocking solution for diluting the antibody which you use for primary antibody. If you don't follow these, these things, it will lead to non-specific binding of antibodies, cross-reactivity, and bleed-through issues. Based on relative target abundance, sometimes we have to use different labeling strategy for our ISC experiment. Thermo Fisher offer variety of secondary antibodies, for example, direct conjugates, standard secondary labeling, primary or secondary antibodies, evitin, biotin amplification, enzyme amplification, or you can use combinations of both. I will go in details about different labeling st strategies in my later slides. First, let's talk about how to decide appropriate labeling strategy. It depends on how abundant is your target. If your target is highly expressed and you want to multiplex with the same primary species, you can use direct conjugates of primary antibodies. If you don't want to multiplex with the same primary species, you can either use secondary antibodies or you can use direct conjugates. If, if your target is medium expressing, 
the best choice is secondary antibodies. If your target is low abundant, you can use streptovidine, avidine antibody conjugates, and for low exp very low expressing targets, thymidine signal amplification kit is the right option. A prime uh, direct conjugates of primary antibody. It's a pri in, in this the primary antibody is conjugated to a fluorescence dye, or the tag that can be detected directly without the need of secondary labeling. There are various advantages of using, using direct uh, conjugate. The you can use same species and same isotype antibodies on same tissue. Staining type time is much shorter, but there are disadvantages also, like only about half of the stand, uh, intensity of the standard secondary lab labeling. If, you ta if your target is low abundant, you can't use direct conjugate antibodies on there. And because of the size of the complex, it will also lead to a penetration issue. In the image on the right, you can see that the protocol is very straightforward, like four step process, fix and permalize the tissue, block with the appropriate serum, incubate with the primary conjugate conjugated antibody and mount the cover slip. Secondary antibody detection. In this, it's a two-step detection process where unconjugated primary antibody is detected with the di-conjugated secondary antibody against the species and isotype of the primary. It's a most commonly used technique. Labeling is uh, sufficiently bright, and we have large selection of commercially available fluorescent secondary antibodies. But it has a disadvantage because protocol time is longer as compared to direct conjugates. You have an uh, you have an additional step. So first, would you bind with the primary antibody? Then the second step is binding with the secondary antibody. So uh, it's a longer protocol time. With multiplex labeling, there are chances of cross reactivity, and and there is also a potential for additional non-specific background. Avitin biotin amplification. While most assays are fine using a di-conjugated secondary antibody or detection, sometimes it's necessary to amplify your signal for a low expressing. This is particularly particularly true with the low expressing antigen or M, or if you want to anti amplify over the ba background. It's a two or three step protocol using an antibody that is tagged with biotin. The biotin is then detected with avidin or related form and multiple streptovidine diconjugate will bind to each antibody with high affinity, increasing the number of dye molecules. Uh, it's a commonly understood and traditional method, much brighter than standard secondary detection, and low abundance targets are more likely to be detected. What are the disadvantages? The disadvantages are, is like longer protocol. Uh, you have to do a special blocking step in between, like endogen. You have to block endogenous biotin, and and it comes with a greater potential for non-specific binding. Uh, Last is, if the amplification is still not enough and you need to amplify further, you can use theramidine signal amplification kit. It's a two or three step process where an antibody is tagged with HRP. The HRP activates a dye labeled substrate, which then binds to residues around the site of the antigen. The dye conjugated theramidine substrate with, with the HRP to covalently bind to tyrosine residues around, around the site of HRP. Uh, this gives you the brightest signal. It is very useful with low abundance targets, and you can bring out the fine structures in the tissue. What are the disadvantages? Increased protocol time. You have to do a special blocking with endogenous peroxidase, and it has a greater potential for non specific binding. So, just let's summarize the most important pro pro points for, for labeling strategies. The key of uh, using an amplification technique is to have an idea about the relative abundance of your target. For high expressing target, a standard secondary detection is enough, or even di even di uh, conjugate is usually sufficient. In in fact, in that cases, if you use the TSA kit, it will oversaturate your signal. For example, 
in the in the image on the right you can see if for a high expressing tubulin if you use tsa or streptorin it will over saturate the signal while the labeled primary or secondary antibody will the, will be the right choice with the low expressing targets like ketanine or something if you try to use labeled primary or the secondary antibody you will get no signal while using streptovidine or tsa you will get the get appropriate appropriate signals so make sure to de decide the right labeling strategy based on your related target abundance you have to find the right balance with every additional detection step you increase you are increasing risk of background due to endogenous components non specific protein binding or non specific dye charge binding with this background let's talk about chlorophore co colors available for your multiplex experiment blue green orange red and deep reds are the are the more, are more common colors in fluorescence we use different color lights lights to generate a fluorescence this is called an called as an excitation light the color you see is the emitted light and you need to use a different filter you need, need to use a filter to filter out the unnecessary lights and and different color need different filters you can also use dyes near IR infra wavelength for your multiplex IHC experiment like Alexa Flow 750 dye, Alexa Flow plus 800 or size 7 dye. But there will be a significant bleed through if you want to use red or deep red dyes. dyes. So it's not a good idea to use a near IR dye as a fourth color if you if you are using red or deep red also in your experiment. Uh, if you really want to do this thing, you need to have a special uh, multispectral imaging platform with the spectral deconvolution deconv functionality. How you will decide the optimal fluorophore and filter for your experiment? There are a couple of rules which you have to keep in mind first know your instrument limitation make sure to know about the excitation short source and detection filters the dye need to be matched to the appropriate filters or light cube it could be the best dye but if it could not match with the excitation show, source and detection filters of your instrument you can't use that know your fluorophore limitations like excitation and emission spectra uh, extension coefficient is also very very important this is the value that indicates how well a fluorophore is going to absorb light or energy the higher the extension coefficient the better it is this is somehow related to how bright a fluorophore is going to be third it's very important to know your target is there any special overlap between your targets are are you going to uh, doing a multiplex experiment with the target located in the same subcellular compartment it's very important you to know about that <clears throat> last uh, use the fluorescence spectra viewer to, tool it will give you an idea about the spectral overlap and bleed through be between the different fluorophore and you you are in the position to choose the better fluorophore and dye combinations for your experiment for example let's talk about the the image on the right uh, it's a, it's it's for alexa 488 which, which is a very common green dye in the purple color you uh, in the blue color you can see the excitation curve of the dye in the pink color you can see the emission curve of the alexa 4, 488 dye if you have to choose the right filters for alexa floor 88 how you will decide so for our evos microscope we suggest uh, GFP, GFP light cubes shown in the bottom right. Why we suggest GFP light cube? As you can see that light cube excitation bandwidth shown in purple and emission bandwidth shown in red complete is, is beautifully overlapping with the Alexa Floor 88 excitation and emission, uh, emission curves. So with, uh, you can use Alexa uh, GFP light light cube confidently with your uh, Alexa 488 tie. 
So if you are using a fluorescence dye, it is important that dye should not overlap spectrally so you can separate the signal. To help you choose the dyes that are spectrally separated from your various assays, we have online spectra viewer, viewer tool. You can enter a large number of dyes and see how their excitation and emission curves overlap with each other. You can enter the specification of your light cubes or filter set as well as laser excitation wavelength to determine if the sets that you have is appropriately matching with the with the dye in question. Remember that careful dye choices means clearly separated labels. For a multiplexing experiment, it's very important that dye should be sufficiently separated in excitation and emission to prevent bleed through through the neighboring channels. So in the in the image on the right, if you have two fluorophores which are separated beautifully spectrally, you don't have an issue. But often this is not possible. Often you have have a dye combination. There there are some overlap in in between. So how you can minimize the bleed through in this situation you can use the corrective measures like you can reduce the concentration of offending dye you can choose a different dye combination that is not spectrally overlapping you can choose a different filter option that has a narrower band pass width or you can use special imaging software to subtract out one image for another. In a situation like, like you, if you have a fluorophore which are almost identical, in that cases, you need a special spectral deconvolution instrument to subtract certain wavelength signals. If you have done immunohistochemistry before, you must have noticed this photo bleaching is issues. What happened that under intense Im illumination of a microscope, fluorescence dyes are prone for pho photo bleaching, irre irreversible fading of the signals. Why this happened? This happened because of the poor dye choices. Some dyes are more prone for photo bleaching. It can happen because of the intensity and time of illumination. The more intense the illumination, the faster the photo bleaching. Or formation of free radicals or reactive ox oxygen species. Exposure of dyes to a light can generate free radicals or reactive ox and reactive oxygen species, particularly siglent oxygen. These can interact with dye molecule to speed degradation. So how you can overcome the photo bleaching issue they are there are a lot of ways you can do that like choosing a more stable dye if by any chance you don't have an option of it choosing a more stable dye you can choose more stable counter stains like DAPI to find focus and orient your uh, orient your T cells and then switch over to the dye which is photo level and take the image as quick as possible reduce the laser power or led voltage uh, you can also reduce the time for visualizing the sample by eyes before capturing the image uh, use a lower power magnification objectives or objective with a lower numerical aperture to find your samples and if you are doing confocal imaging you can reduce average number of scans per line make sure it's very important to store your sample in darkness avoid them from direct sunlight and to reduce the problem issue of uh, reactive oxygen species or, or or the formation of free radical you can use a mountain with the uh, with a mounted with the cap capabilities of antioxidant capabilities of free radical scavenger uh, use a curing mounting me mounting media for your immunohistochemistry experiment what happened that hardening slows down the movement of free radicals and ros make sure to keep the slides cold after your after the curing uh, and store them in the in a, in a cold room to avoid the free movement of free radicals and ro ros 
to increase photo stability thermo fisher offer a wide varieties of photo stable dyes like alexa flow dyes they are very bright dyes they are photo stable we have uh, these dyes matched to common filters and we also have a dye alexa flow plus which are which are more which are which is five times more sensitive than traditional alexa for secondary antibodies as you can see in the picture on the right alex how bright the alexa flow plus as compared to traditional alexa flow dyes uh, to minimize photo beaching of experiment and samples, we have developed a series of anti-fade reagent that increase fluoros fluorophore photo stability in both live and fixed cells. We offer like choice of uh, immediate imaging uh, or anti-fades for immediate imaging or for long-term for storage. Uh, <laughs> And they also come with or without without DAPI. Based on your experimental need, you can either order, order the, get them with, with DAPI or without the DAPI. So these are uh, these are the exam. You can on the on the right you you can see an example where we have done 60 second time lapse showing the, showing the enhanced resistance of our prolonged gold, prolonged diamond, and prolonged glass over traditional mounting media gla like glycerol. With the glycerol, the photo bleaching is significantly higher as compared to prolonged gold and diamond and glass. They they reduce photo bleaching in the time course experiment. Now let's talk about the importance of controls in, in a multiplexing experiment. They are very important part of immunohistochemistry experiment, but often researchers does not realize its importance. If you are doing a multiplexing experiment, you should have three main important control. The first is autofluorescence control. In this control, you should you have no primary or secondary or dyes of any sort. The sample should be washed, mounted, and imaged in the same way. This will give you an idea about the native autofluorescence of your sample. The second control is no primary control. This is to check non-specific binding of the secondary antibody, streptovidine or thiramidine. The sample should be washed, mounted, and imaged in a in the same way. The third control is no cross-labeling control. If you are using multiple primary and secondary, it's uh, you should <coughs> check the commercial source of cross-adsorption. Perform single color labeling with the wrong pairs to make sure the antibody does not bind to the other specific other primary antibodies. With this control, the objective of using these three control is, is to it will give you confidence and hopefully all these controls are negative and then you can uh, use uh, do your experiment with confidence. Another important aspect of immunohistochemistry is counter stain. Counter stains are chemical and fluorescence dye which are used to identify targets in combination with antibodies. They provide contrast of the primary stain and can be cell structure specific. Uh, they are very important to orient sample due in immunohistochemistry experiment. You should perform counter staining in the last and common counter stains are nucleic acid counter stains and actin cytoskeleton skin like DAPI, you know, Photofluorotect, phalodine for actin scale. You can also use uh, uh, clicket EDU kits for uh, using proliferating cells as a counter stain. These are some examples with the of the count of the counter stains. In the last, <clears throat> let's talk about just to summarize. I want to tell you about some important rules to remember for your multiplex ISC experiments. For antibody fluorofluor pairing, it's very important to pair the weakest staining antibody with the brightest fluorophore and pair the antibody with the strongest labeling and the most abundant target expression with the weakest available fluorophore. In that way, you can find the right balance. The second thing is how you can overcome epitope masking. Epitope masking is another factor that can add complexity for ach achieving accurate staining when you are performing multiplexing. Epitope masking can occur when you have a multiple tar uh, epito antibodies which are directed against epitopes located in the same subcellular compartments of the same cells in a tissue. 
for example like if you are using tsa amplification a thyramidine is deposited over the first such epitope uh, and it can blanket nearby epitopes that you are trying to stain later so there are approaches in which you can overcome this issue of epitope masking like titration of secondary antibody titration of thyramidine fluorophore complexes you can uh, you should optimize the incubation time for both the secondary and thyramidine fluorophore complex make sure to choose fluorophore based on target abundance check the spectral overlap check instrument excitation and emission filter and very important don't over excite your fluorophores thanks thank you darpin for your informative presentation we will now start the live q a portion of the webinar if you have a question you'd like to ask please do so now we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for now let's get started. Our first question here is, how can you determine whether you need to adjust the concentration of your primary or secondary antibody? Okay, this is a very good question. Yeah, for every expert, every time if you are trying to do any antibody for the first time, it's, it's better to uh, to adjust the concentration of primary and secondary antibody. If you don't do that, it will lead to oversaturation of signal or either you will get no signal. So su suppose the uh, manufacturer recommended concentration of one to 200 for the primary antibody, I will recommend you to try two or three different concentration like one to 100, one to 200, or more like one to 300 and see in which which concentration you are getting the best staining where the signal to noise ratio is minimal you are doing a nuclear staining and you are getting a nuclear signal not the cytoplasmic staining if you are doing a cytoplasmic staining you are not getting anything in the nucleus so that that's why it's very important to determine the primary antibody concentration for sex similarly with the secondary antibody it's important to have the right band balance. If you use too much a secondary antibody, it will give you non-specific binding. So make sure to have the secondary antibody concentration also optimized similarly as the primary antibody concentration. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question here, are there any tips for mounting the slide and can you use too much mounting media? Yeah, so it's very important to mount slide very, pro very properly don't use too much mounting media. Don't use too less mounting media. It should be like for a, if you have a suppose mouse brain section, one or two drops will be enough to. Uh, it should be like enough to cover the section. And when you are putting your cover slip on the uh, put in a slight angle and drop it slowly as slow, slow as possible so that it does not create air bubbles in it. Because if the if your tissue has air bubbles, you it will your whole immunohistochemistry experiment will be no use because you have too much bubbles in the tissue. Thank you. Um, next question here: When permeabilizing tissue, should your detergent be in the wash solution, blocking buffer, or antibody dilute diluent, or both? For permalization buffer, I would recommend your, uh, you can have uh, like a lower concentration of detergents like try, uh, like tween 20 in your wash buffer, but I will not recommend to use uh, uh, any detergent in your uh, antibody dilution steps. It, it should only be in the permalization buffer and not in the antibody dilution buffers. Thank you. Lots of great questions coming in here. Um, our next one, do you have any recommended methods for antibody stripping and how much loss do we expect between cycles and how many times can you do it? Yeah, my recommendation for antibody is stripping it. You can you can start with like a heat a heat induced antigen retrieval step. First, start with a like a, because there will always always going to be a tissue loss. Or more you will do more cycles of heat and induced antigen retrieval you will do, and start with like a some mild buffer with the less pH like citrate buffer with pH six. Don't go with the higher pH of citrate buffer, and if you don't if you if you are using your in house reagents, I will recommend maximum two cycles of strip not more than that because uh, you will definitely going to lose a lot of tissue around the around it and there 
will be always going to be some antibody left. Great, thank you. Next question here. Um, how long do slides need to be left to dry before imaging? Yeah, so my recommendation is like uh, slide, after mounting left, leave your slide at the room temperature in the dark for like six to eight hours. After that, the best way is like uh, to keep the slides stored in a cold room. Now I will not recommend more than eight hours leaving the slides in the room temperature. Thank you. Another question. What is the key thing to follow in multiplexing if the spatial location of the two antigens is the same? Yeah, that's a very good question. For if you are doing a multiple multiplexing and your your target is on the same subcellular location, uh, you should know the abundance of the target. Try to have your target, which is like highly expressing pair with the fluorophore, which is the weakest, and, and the target, which is low expressing, pair with the fluorophore, which is bright, uh, which is more brighter, and use the, use the, use the different concentration of fluorophores or fluorophore dilutions also to get the right balance. Great. Lots of questions still. <laughs> Let's see. Um... Another person is asking, what are the major differences between different ways of blocking and any particular considerations? Yeah, so there are like different blocking pupil use, serum for blocking pupil use. Uh, P. So main consideration for blocking is that what you are trying to do. Like if you are using like a goat antibody, which, which is raised in a goat, so and you want to do a multiplexing, then use the goat uh, serum as a blocking reagent. If you are using antibody which is raised in a donkey, use the donkey. And for a, and if you are doing a multiplexing experiment where you have different combinations of mice antibody and you want to use on a mice tissue, then then use the mouse blocking uh, blocking reagent. So it depends on what you are trying to achieve and what primary and secondary antibodies combinations you are using. Uh, that it, it, then you can decide that this is the appropriate blocking agent. And for and also I can mention that. If uh, you can use like uh, uh, FBS or something and make, make sure to try different blocking reagent and see, see, see where you are getting low signal to noise ratio. Thank you for that. Another question, can you talk about how the prolong mountant compares to DPX in terms of fade prevention? Your example mentioned uh, glycerol. I uh, unfortunately I am not familiar of DPX. I have always used Prolong Mountain, and what, based on my experience uh, with the immunohistochemistry, I have seen the the tissue which are you mounted with Prolong Gold. They are good for months. I I have even used the Prolong Gold mounted tissue after two years, and the fluorescence was maintained. I have no idea about the DPS mounting media. Thank you, Darvin. Um, the next question, do you have any tips on how to have successful antigen retrieval for brain slices? Which one is better, heating or enzymatic treatment? Yeah, so heat uh, depends on what you are trying to do. If, you are, uh, if your brain tissue, the, if it's like you are using a tissue who has like injured injury tissues, then antigen retrieval sometimes become very hard because you are going to lose tissue around the injury site. Like if you are using a, using multiple sclerosis models, there is a lesion around it and you will lose the tissue. Then antigen retrieval will be harsh. But if you have an overly fixed tissue, uh, then proteinase K treatment will be proteinase treatment will be the best treatment because it will uh, break the methyl bridge which is formed by the formalin. If you want to, if you are not getting any any straining and want to try antigen retrieval, I will suggest you try for like a lower time first, like try for a, for a 10 minutes. Don't over boil the tissue and take out the tissue out from the from the boiling media and make sure to tissue to dry uh, like cold cold down instead of just putting the reagent or washing buffer on it. Otherwise, you will break the tissue around the injury site. Great, thank you. And a related question: Do we need antigen retrieval step for frozen tissue? 
Yes. Uh, if you are trying to stain like uh, antigen, which are intracellular, which are, where they are in the intracellular compartment, it's better to use the antigen retrieval step because you want your 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 antibody to reach to the internally. So in that case, I will recommend to use the antigen retrieval on the frozen tissue. I have personally used that, and there I find it works beautifully, and you will give you a crisp crisp staining. Thank you. I believe you might have already spoken on this, but should the slide be very dry before putting mounting media? No, I, I will not. If you are, if you are using uh, fresh for, uh, like a frozen tissue, uh, slides should not be very dry. Otherwise, uh, you will find it very difficult to do staining future. So if you are using our prolonged gold or prolonged any prolonged mounted, there, there is no need of uh, drying the slide. You just have to remove the access buffer from the tissue and just put the mounting media and mount the slides. Thank you. Another question here, what are the key differences to completing immunofluorescence staining in a well plate and on a slide? Uh, the key difference if you are doing on a plate or on you are doing on a, on a tissue is that the there will be difference in the antigen retrieval and permalization buff because if you are working on a on a on a cells you don't want to do very harsh antigen retrieval or permalization instead you can't use very like the concentration of permalization buffer between 20 and triton x will be very less in the in, with, with the cell as compared to the tissues so that's the major major difference it comes thank you have time for a few more questions um do you recommend using bsa along with serum uh, BSA along with serum. Yes, you in in some cases you you can combine them together and use it. Uh, depend if if you are getting lot of unspecific uh, staining and you think that uh, it's it's not sufficient, you can combine them together like 2.5 percent of BSA and 2.5 percent of serum, uh, and then just try it and see if it's your signal to noise ratio is better with the combination or not. Thank you. And someone is saying, you mentioned starting with the concentration that is mentioned in the protocol for primary AB. So when we are titrating, what concentrations above and below the recommended concentrations would you suggest? Yeah, so suppose the it's recommended to use one to hundred concentration. What I will do, I will try three or four different concentration. I like I will use a pep pen and make a uh, make a barrier around my sec my four sections on a slide and I will treat one to 50 on one, one to 100 on second, one to 200 on third and one to 300, like three or four combina combination on the same slide. And I can see side by side which one is giving me better signal and which is the most reliable one. Great. Another question, fro researchers who are new to IHC what would be the most common mistake that can easily be avoided? Yeah, sometime I have I have ex my experience that most common mi mistake people do that they don't realize the importance of each and every step of immunohistochemistry. Like uh, sometimes they take very lightly with the washing step, like, oh, it's recommended five minute three washing. What happened if I will do three and a half minute of three washing? It's fine. Uh, it matters if you do on uh, if the washing is not appropriate if you do wa incomplete washing what will happen that it will lead to a uh, lot of background in your tissue in your staining so washing is the thing which i have noticed with several researchers they they, they take it very lightly oh just it's fine just washing but washing should be very critical another thing i have noticed they don't realize that um, the concentration of antibodies and the and the incubation time also matter you you can't have like oh adding more does not give you the better signal so it should be the appropriate uh, concentration and don't over bleach the tissue no don't over excite the tissue because in that case is also they just float, float to bleach the tissues thank you our next question here is, do you think it is mandatory to use normal IgG as a control of primary antibody? If so, please leave tips. 
it's not mandatory it, it depends on your what you want to do by basically I, I i never use it so it's up to you if you want to use it in a normal igz as a control you you can use it but it's it's not mandatory thank you another question here um there are protocols using only a pb phosphate buffer throughout and ones using pb and pbs phosphate buffered saline there that are used differently for washing and antibody staining steps does this distinction matter uh, i don't uh, do, do, they, they are basically the either you use phosphate buffer or phosphate buffer saline they basically are the same so there's uh, there's no difference between the uh, it does not matter whatever you are using for your experiment Awesome. Couple more here. Do you recommend beta mer? I'm gonna have trouble pronouncing this. <laughs> Mercapatolon for AB stripping. I have personally never used beta mercaptothenol for antibody straining. I have used for it for Western and it works perfectly for, for immunohistochemistry experiments. Uh, I have not used it. So I I can't suggest it. If you want, I can look, dig into the literature and get back to you after the webinar that people have used it or not. I personally did not use it for immunistic chemistry experiments. Thank you. Um, and then someone is wondering uh, which hematoxylin is good, Mayer's or Gill hematoxylin? Actually, I have no idea about that. I have not used hematoxylin, and so I have to look into it. Thank you. Um, what is your take on universal antigen retrieval buffers? Do they work better than citrate or other specific pH retrieval buffers? Yeah, universal buffers also work very beautifully. I have personally used commercial buffers from different vendors, and they they work similarly as the as if you have making citrate buffer in the lab or you are purchasing it from. They basically work fine and with more efficiency as compared to the in-house uh, made reagents which you are making like, because there should be different between the composition of the, uh, there's different of the water you will use, the pH and those type of things. If you use the commercial one, the pH is guaranteed and the best quality reagents are used. So I have used it before and it works good. Thank you. As a blocking solution, how much is the percentage of serum concentration recommended? And is there any high concentration serum effect? Uh, mainly I, uh, recommended, I prefer to use between two to 5% of uh, serum concentration. Sometimes uh, sometime people use uh, more concentration. Or it, it will be go good for one particular target, but it's not going to good for your multiplex experiment because it will uh, it will create unnecessary. Your antibodies will not bind because of the excess serum. So what I will suggest that if you are doing a multiplexing experiment, try two to five percent, not going more than that. Otherwise, you will get one antigen work beautifully and other are not working because of the overuse of serum. Great, thank you. Um, someone is wondering, um, how can we reduce the overlap of fluorescent? So it's something like for overlap of fluorescence, like use the spectra viewer to, tool and see that how they are, where they are, uh, are they overlapping, how much, some overlap is always going to be, the, but if it's a too much of a overlap, it's not a good idea to use that. and. You, for the two-plex assay, you, you can use like uh, use the far red and the green and so that they cannot bleed into each other. But there should be always, uh, you should always be careful about the, with this, there is spectra. Uh, use the lower concentration, use the lower incubation time for the prime, for the secondary antibodies and the excited and the Exposure when you're taking doing the imaging, reduce the exposure time so that bleed through should be less. Thank you. Um, another question related to drying How much do you need to dry the tissue in the slide after each wash step? Uh, I will recommend there is no need to excessively dry the tissue. Just remove the excess excess liquid out from the from the slide. Uh, but uh, there is like what I personally prefer that I I just use my hands and flick it, and so that the all the excess liquid comes down. That's much drying is required, not more than that. 
Thank you. Um, someone is wondering, we see a blues haze um, intermittent on our tissue sections after cover slipping. Is there a way to prevent this? We use DAAPI for nuclear staining and changing concentrations of that, and it did not make any difference. Okay. So what does uh, my question will be for you that what concentration of uh, DAPI you are using may try to reduce the concentration of the DAPI. Maybe you are using too much of a DAPI and uh, maybe induce like one one additional washing step before mounting that tissue. Maybe it's possible that too much of a DAPI is around the tissue and that's why you are getting the haze. So uh, two point reduce the concentration of the DAPI and then second uh, induce uh, in. Uh, have one washing step in between the mounting. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, any questions we don't get to, um, we will follow up after this is over. Um, I will truly end with a few more here. <laughs> we have a few more minutes. So is it possible to perform multiplexing staining with amplification using fluor fluorophore conjugated avidin? Yeah, yeah, you can, you you can you can do that. There should be no no problem that you can do multiplexing with diff, uh, using fluorophore conjugated evidence. Make sure that uh, do sequentially. Don't try to do all, all all three or four multiplexing antibodies together. Do in a sequential manner so that in that case you can do it. Thank you. We'll wrap with this one. Avoiding heating for antigen retrieval, would you like to recommend any antigen retrieval buffer, any methods or techniques? So sometimes it's very important to do the antigen retrieval. There is no choice. You are not getting any, any staining and you have to do it. So in that case, what I will suggest you to try, if you are using a citrate buffer, try to do the use the lower pH of citrate buffer in, instead of using pH 9, use the pH. With the pH 9, you will get the bright signals, but uh, there will be a tissue damage also. So I will recommend lower pH of citrate buffer. And what I have personally seen that if you if you if you are not worried about your tissue loss, do the antigen retrieval for 10 minutes, take the slide out and put in the ice cold uh, PBS, you will get a very crisp signals. But the opposite happen if you have a tissue where which is like a damaged tissue where you ha have a chances of losing that tissue. If you do that, there will be tissue loss. So if you are using a perfect brain se brain section. Do the antigen retrieval, wash your tissue immediately with the cold PBS and get the crisp staining. Great, thank you. Thank you again so much, Darfin, for your time today and your important research. We'd like to also thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcasts. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for all their interesting questions. Any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you.